Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm James Harding, editor and co-founder of Tortoise, and this is the last session, I can't quite believe, in our Summit on AI, the Tortoise AI Summit. And we're incredibly pleased and, and privileged and, frankly, personally quite excited that we have Professor Shoshana Zuboff here. Um, Shoshana, hello and welcome. Um, uh, I've always thought that great ideas happen in great chairs, and you are now the living proof of that. <laughs> uh, um, I have colossal chair envy. Um, but we, we have spent the day trying to think through the way in which AI is going to tackle some of the biggest problems of, of our times. And as I think everyone on the call will know, you're probably the author of the most important book in thinking about the intersection between technology, digital and data on the one side and uh, government, society and economy on the other. Um, it's your first time at a tortoise thinking. Our spirit in these things is to try and run them like an open newsroom, an open news meeting. And so as ever, we hope that we'll be able to hear in the chat as you speak points of view and uh, thoughts from people all around the world listening in, eager to hear how you think the next phase of the technological revolution is going to impact in the light of COVID-19. But I hope you'll allow me at the very start just to ask you to set out the idea of surveillance capitalism itself, um, because heaven knows you'll do a better job than I would. Okay, so uh, normally it makes sense to, you know, just lay out the basics. What is surveillance capitalism? All right. So, you know, capitalism has traditionally evolved by taking things that live outside the marketplace, bringing them into the marketplace so that they can become commodities, something that can be sold and purchased. Yay, we're making money. All right, so uh, famously, as everybody knows, industrial capitalism had its eye on nature and suddenly things like forests and meadows became land and real estate, right? Something that could be sold and purchased and yay, we're making money. So here we are in the uh, early 21st century and uh, the fledgling data companies in Silicon Valley are looking around for exactly how are we gonna make money? <laughs> it wasn't clear. Some of us are old enough to remember, right, James? <laughs> it wasn't clear. No. <laughs> they were so, not making uh, money, in fact, yes. They were not making money and they were attracting investment. They weren't making money. The, the uh, ratios were way out of line and um, and then there was something called the dot-com bust and everybody got scared. So today we're talking a lot about state of exception. Well, this was a state of exception in Silicon Valley starting at Google. And when their own investors threatened to pull out, um, even though you know they were considered like the smartest guys in town and the best search engine and they had everything going for them, but even they, became vulnerable. And so now the idea was ads, advertising, online advertising, which they had rejected early on as something that would disfigure and corrupt search and indeed disfigure and corrupt the internet. Now it was going to be, how do we make, how do we make money with advertising? And what they discovered was that from the leftover data People searched, they browsed, the company used those data to improve search and browsing, but there was a lot of leftover data. Back then they considered it waste material, digital exhaust. They discovered, and we won't go through all the details, they discovered that in those leftover data were rich predictive signals, behavioral signals, what people were likely to do. Now, <clears throat> About uh, sometime in the year 2001, these discoveries began around 2000. Sometime in the year 2001, Larry Page, one of the brilliant founders, was asked the question, what is Google? Mm. And it was kind of a game because uh, for quite a while, 
folks at that company had been trying to answer the question, what is Google? Nobody quite knew. But then by 2001, Larry Page answered the question. And he said, if we had to say what Google is, we would say that our business is personal information. Everything you do, everything you say, everywhere you go, every aspect of your experience will be searchable, will be indexable, will become predictable, will become monetizable. That's Google. And the reason he could say that is that they discovered that through those rich predictive signals, they could now send these data into their analytic hub, which even back then they called AI, mm -hmm. uh, even though it was you know, obviously nothing compared to what, what we're doing today. And out of that could come a computational product. What was that product? It was a tiny little prediction of a small piece of human behavior. They called it the click-through rate. So what is the click-through rate? It's simply a computational fragment that predicts a fragment of human behavior. What ad you're likely to click on, and if you're going to click through to that website, right? That's a prediction, a prediction product. And what they discovered in 2000, 2001, is that they could sell prediction products. Right. They could sell them to advertisers who wanted to know where people would click, what they were likely to do next. These online now targeted advertising markets supplanted everything about traditional advertising. Advertisers used to choose where they would put their ads on a basis of what was consistent with their brand values. All mm -hmm. that went out the window. Now it was the computational black box telling the, the advertiser, telling the company, here's where you put your ad, trust us, you'll make money, we'll make money. Mm -hmm. Today, we can see that those online targeted advertising markets were the first globally successful markets in trading human futures. These are markets in human futures, just like we have markets in oil futures or pork belly futures, trading human futures. And they were the first, but not the last markets of that kind that made this new economic logic of surveillance capitalism unbelievably successful and, and these, turned, so, sorry. So, I just want to say, and these are what you describe as surveillance assets, that then those, those individual human futures are surveillance assets. Is that the way you see them? So what puts the word surveillance in the term surveillance capitalism? And that's, that's something really, really important for everybody to understand. You know, we think that we're making a personal trade-off, a personal calculation. Um, I know that they, you know, they take some of my data when, you know, if, if I decide to shop for slippers online because uh, it's easier. I know that they're gonna take some bit of data about that, but I decide that the convenience is worth, worth, uh, worth that trade-off, yeah. right? So we're, we're, uh, we're harboring the illusion that privacy is a personal phenomenon, a private phenomenon, and that it's all about this private calculation that we make a trade-off for a little bit of convenience. The fact of the matter is that when, when we understand how these systems operate, it's only a tiny fragment of the data that they're computing that actually represents the data we knowingly give them, what we knowingly disclose. Right from the start, and these patents were already coming on stream in 2001, 2002, 2003, the, the scientists, the engineers, the designers were learning how to hunt and capture personal information from all over the web and celebrating in their own 
um, discourse and their own write-ups of their patents and their own communications, celebrating the fact that they could find personal information that people never intended to disclose. And they could aggregate personal information and they could make inferences about people that were highly intimate What's your sexual orientation? What's your political orientation? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That people never imagined mm. could be known about them. So right from the start, the entire operation depended on taking from us without our knowledge. That's called stealing, right? So surveillance capitalism, depends upon this foundational, what I think of as the original sin that founds the whole economic logic. And that original sin is the illegitimacy of stealing our private experience, considering it free raw material for translation into behavioral data. Now that free raw material think we take the meadows, we take the forests. That free raw material becomes proprietary data that flows into their data supply chains. Think of conveyor belts rushing all these proprietary data now, newly acquired proprietary data, data taken from our lives, conveying those into the new manufacturing facilities, which we call AI. Right. we call machine learning Could what's we... happening in that hub just one last little thought leaked facebook document 2018 giving us a vision of its ai hub the center of its manufacturing operation what's it telling us in the ai hub this is facebook's language trillions of data points ingested every hour hmm. trillions of data points ingested every hour again only a tiny fragment of those trillions are what we knowingly disclose in addition six million predictions of human behavior produced every second right, right. that's the kind of volume the massive scale surveillance operation upon which these economics depend to produce the best predictions of our behavior to generate the greatest amount of revenue in these human futures markets, which now account for, and then I'll stop, <laughs> now account for about 89% of Google's trillion dollar market capitalization mm -hmm. and about 98% um, of Facebook's I believe now it's about a $633 billion market capitalization. That's what surveillance capitalism has achieved as it now leaves the tech sector and migrates through the normal economy into just about every industry. And, and Shoshana, I definitely don't want you to stop. I actually want to, to expand. I just wanted to, it seems to me as though when we begin to understand then surveillance capitalism, I'd like to take us through and then understand how it changes, I, I guess, in profound ways with the capacity of artificial intelligence and how it changes against the social and political backdrop of COVID-19. But before yes. I did that, I just wanted to just test one of the things, if you like, kick the tires on one of the arguments you make. You say it's stealing, right? And I suppose the, the tech giants would say to that, well, hang on, both in the small print and in the big picture, we don't see it like that. In the small print, we send you these reams of terms and conditions. I appreciate they're unreadable, but it's, it's there in the small print. Or in the big picture, they'd say, look, people generally understand that they're going to get all the benefits and advantages of YouTube or, or any other service. And they increasingly tell us that they're willing to hand over a certain amount of anonymized data if they can get that quality of service for free. And so they would say it's not stealing. In different ways, it's a deal or a contract. Well, if it wasn't stealing, then it would be transparent. 
and the fact is that it's hidden. And the fact is that um, within their own documents, within their own language, within their own talk, within their own speeches, within their own earnings calls, um, and within their own published research, they celebrate the fact that they can acquire all of these data flows without users knowing. <laughs> so, you know, I, I obviously uh, both the companies and so far, typically the courts, at least in, in America still, um, James, you know, have, have hidden behind and have legitimated the notice and consent. Yes. But literally every single person who studies this field, every legal scholar and, uh, and, and, and every ordinary user has come to the conclusion that notice and consent is a kind of kabuki drama <laughs> that we are forced to march through, right? In the kabuki drama, the, you know, the beautiful figure comes out and says, I am the sun. And, and the other comes out and says, I am the moon. And, and then the drama unfolds with these metaphors. Well, uh, the kabuki here is that you click on something and it's I am notice and you click on something else and it's I am consent. Mm -hmm. And everybody involves knows that it is a, it is a, a, a cynical, empty operation, right? So in, in, uh, in your beautiful city at the University of London in 2017, two of, uh, of, uh, of our field's you know, greatest legal scholars did an analysis of one Nest thermostat. Right. And they asked the question, you know, what's, what's the privacy deal here with the Nest thermostat? What's going on here? So they did the forensics. What is this thermostat actually doing? They read all of the uh, notice and consent agreements. They figured out that this little, this little device, streaming data to third parties who are streaming data to third parties or streaming data to third parties, all of your in intimate data is being collected in these Nest hubs and shunted onward and onward and onward. And at each stage, no entity takes responsible, takes responsibility, excuse me, for what happens to those data. So the conclusion of their analysis is that any mildly vigilant consumer who installs one of these contraptions should review in all good conscience, a minimum of 1000 privacy contracts <laughs> because basically this is just an unending supply chain ecosystem of rape and pillage right. so i want to say you know the only thing that i think is really contestable of when i when i say this is stealing mm. the only thing that makes that statement contestable is the fact that we do not yet have laws yeah. to protect our private human experience, to officially make what I have just described stealing. Right. So that when I walk down the faith, when I walk down the street, you know, the, the tech companies in the United States have fought bitterly for the right to be able to take my face and your face wherever our faces appear whether we're walking in the park and we're picked up by a camera or um, maybe I posted my face on face, Facebook as part of mm -hmm. a family photo that I was sending to relatives uh, who, who don't live nearby. Um, they have bitterly claimed and bitterly fought for this right to have our faces. Why? Not just for straight up identity. They sell that to law enforcement and so forth but because faces have lots of little muscles in them and those muscles make hundreds of different kinds of gestures those gestures turned out to be highly predictive of our emotions 
and our emotions are the best predictors of our future behavior. And that's where the bottom line is. So, 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 so that, that, that drives you kind of inevitably to the next phase of this, which is yes. how you, how you digest you being an artificial intelligence system, digest those pieces of data to understand better human behavior. What is the overlay then of AI on this system of surveillance capitalism? Well, the overlay here, I think, you know, I think the, um, I think very quickly what we, what we want to put into our, our, our diagram here, put into our stage setting, is that once you ask that question, we are not simply talking about technology. We are not simply talking about technological capabilities and the wonders of AI. You mm -hmm. see, the great, um, the great crime here, in a way, <laughs> is that after all of this effort, all of this effort to create the trillions of data points every hour and the six million predictions every second, what is it for? Right? right now we have created a world and we can talk about how this happened but the bottom line is we have created a world where the the, the large surveillance capitalists own and operate the internet yes these large companies essentially have a corner on uh the uh front line AI capabilities on the front line, uh, servers, storage, analytical capabilities, data science, and indeed the data scientists themselves who make AI possible. They've bought up most of the, uh, you know, amazing genius AI startups. Mm -hmm. They have a concentration of, of, uh, of power in this AI sphere. So we come back to the three essential political questions, not the technological questions. What are those questions? First of all, the distribution of knowledge mm -hmm. that comes from AI. Who knows? Who knows about these trillions of data points every hour? Who knows about these six million predictions of behavior every second? Who knows? The second question is about authority. Who decides who knows? <laughs> what are the sources of legitimacy that decide who gets access to all of this knowledge? Right? And the third question, the third institutional question, is about power. Who decides who decides who knows? Now, let's look at how this is set up right now around AI. Who knows? Mostly, it's the surveillance capitalists that know. Who decides who knows? What is the source of authority? The source of authority right now is the, uh, is, is the, um, is the actual uh, um, uh, concentration of capital in these companies the fact that their market capitalization has grown to literally unprecedented proportions on the back of these operations that is the grounding now that gives them the authority right where they go out and they uh they uh, can corner the market on on the scientists because they can pay more than any other kind of university or government and they can uh, invest in the, these, these incredible te technological capabilities. Can, can, uh, okay. Shoshana, so, I'm just going I'm, I'm to interrupt you one second, I'm just yeah. not sure I totally understand that. O on the authority point, if I understand what you're saying, then who decides who knows is determined by the fact that these companies now are so wealthy that they can actually make decisions about concentrations of intellectual capital within their businesses, influence how the political process itself 
views these companies that their wealth is giving them the authority to decide who knows is that am I, do i understand that right yes because okay, it's quite. not yes and that and that authority derives from their their wealth it derives from yeah. surveillance capital because uh think about it they're not elected right yeah. they don't operate under democratic oversight they don't operate under um uh, uh societal charters of rights in in the united states they don't operate under constitutional constraints yes so it's really the sheer um the sheer uh weight of that capital right. that provides the authority for them to to move ahead Got it. And, and finally it, what is the source of power yeah the source of power is that this is all coming from a market that incentivizes these operations the fact that we have markets that are <clears throat> that are um uh they are unregulated they are unimpeded by law they do not operate under the rule of law they do not operate under democratic oversight it is just sheer uh, market operation that creates the incentives, that produces the revenues and the profits, attracts the investment, that then um, affords the ability to create these capabilities and to harbor these capabilities as proprietary. Okay. Right? Uh, so uh, these are culture. institutional and political questions. Mm -hmm. long before we get to technological questions about AI. And, and, I, and I, just wanted to pick up, I, I just wanted to pick up on that, because that's, that's completely fascinating and compelling. And I suppose if we've been sitting here having this conversation, you know, um, three months ago, the, the truth is that I think the wind would have been in the sails of your argument, right? Yep. It, it now <laughs> feels to me as though you're sailing into the wind to an extent, because you're suddenly seeing political opinion, and it's hard to gauge, but possibly public opinion saying, yes, I understand all of these points, but the reality is technology can really help us with testing and tracing and potentially get us back to our normal lives. And so I as an individual and society in general should be much more willing to surrender certain rights uh, and, and potentially quite profound ones, not just about our own individual behaviors, but our, our, our personal networks of behavior. Um, and we're willing to do that for the sake of public health and, and the revival of the economy. What, what, what do you make of what's happening to, if you like, the, the politics of surveillance capitalism as a result? Well, look, I think that in the way, in the way you frame that question, James, and I'm, and I'm so glad that you've done this, mm. um, there are a bunch of really important issues that are sort of conflated and, and mixed up together. Yeah. And so let's, let's pull them apart and see if we can make some sense of what you've just said. The great tragedy of surveillance capitalism, as I see it, is that when we talk about these um, incredible AI capabilities, the trillions of data points, the millions of predictions, uh, everything that these historic technologies are capable of doing. The great tragedy is that they are not being put to the use of society. Right. Those, those trillions of data points and, and millions of predictions per second are not for the sake of, for example, solving the climate catastrophe. They're not for the sake of, for example, curing and treating uh, a hundred different kinds of cancers that have eluded science. They're not for the sake of um, generating the systems and the institutions that can support flooding the world with smart and loving teachers and doctors who will change the face of civilization by their presence, their intelligence, and their compassion. 
not doing any of that, James. Mm -hmm. What it's doing is predicting our behavior to sell to business customers for the sake of revenues in these narrow human futures markets and their spectacular financial incentives. It's what I call the surveillance dividend. These, these world historic capabilities are being put to use to produce a surveillance dividend so that the Ford Motor Company can say, hey, instead of working so hard to try to make money selling cars, forget about that. We're going to reinvent ourselves as a, um, a data, uh, data transportation system. And we're going to stream data from the 100 million people driving around in our cars. And then we're going to have data sets on a par with Google and Facebook, and everybody's going to want to invest in us. Right. right? This, is, this is how it has <coughs> skewed and, in my view, disfigured our economies and pulled capitalism, if I may say so, away from the one thing that ever... Uh, that, that ever had the power to tether capitalism to democracy and to the well-being of society. And that is it pulled it away from the really deep connections of supply and demand, right? So, like so that's this, what Henry Ford was all about. People so, want to buy cars, but they need them at a price they can afford. So, so this is not, so, so, so Shoshana, this is not then in your mind a crisis of technology as much as a crisis of democracy. So, so what we have now is digital technology. Here we are, James. We're in the digital century. This was supposed to be the century, James. It was supposed to be the democratization of knowledge, mm -hmm. the democratization of learning, a golden age for our civilization. Instead, based on everything we've just discussed, we have marched into the digital century, found, finding ourselves now on the cusp of this third decade, not marked by the democratization of knowledge and a golden mm. age, mm. but unpredictably, startlingly, even shockingly, marked by a new kind of feudal pattern F-E-U-D, <laughs> mm, also possibly F-U-T-I-L-E, <laughs> a new feudal and yeah. futile pattern, right, that, that uh, throws us back to the past of this very um, uh, steeply unequal concentrations of knowledge and the power that accrues to such knowledge to not only know everything about us, but then to use that behavior to actually tune and herd our own action as, as individuals, as groups, and as populations, moving us in the direction that optimize surveillance uh, capitalism's revenue flows. That's exactly what is happening today. So when it comes to democracy, if I may, and then yeah, I'll... Yeah, please do, please um, do. When it comes to democracy, we see these threats operating on two levels, right? In our own lives, this... Uh, the, the, we have to think of surveillance capitalism. It, this is no longer those, those um, heroic and exciting, fledgling baby companies that we had 20 years ago you know, that were going to carry us into the digital age on the heroic shoulders of these uh, young geniuses. These are now information empires that operate ruthlessly, claiming all of this knowledge taken from our experience as proprietary on the back of which all of their profits flow, right? So these are, these are, huge systems of unaccountable power mm -hmm. because we have allowed them to operate without law for 20 years, for two decades. So, so from, from the grassroots, if, if you will, these systems are a direct assault on 
what we think of as human agency, as human autonomy, because we know that they are designed to operate outside of our awareness in order to be able to tune and heard. They use subliminal cues, the manipulation of online social comparison dynamics. They use the rewards and punishments of gamification. They use um, real-time rewards and punishments. I'll raise your insurance premium if you drive safely based on my streaming sensors from your car. I'll, um, I'll, uh, sorry, I'll raise it if you drive in a dangerous way and mm -hmm. I'll lower it if you drive mm -hmm. safely. I can do all of this in real time, mustering this, this uh, paradigm of rewards and punishments to shape your behavior in ways that align with, with, um, you know, with profit. Okay. So, 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 so Shoshana, I, don't know, I just want to interrupt yes. because we're, we're going to run out of time, and, and, and okay, I want, I want to get, I want to get if we, if we can, then to how you take an understanding of where we are, right? and as you say, these these information empires. How could you take those, and then turn them to the public good? How do you say, of course, there are now these capabilities that exist. It doesn't have to be surveillance. It doesn't have to be stealing. It, it could build on habits and practices that to an extent already exist. There are large areas of the internet that actually have improved the way in which we live. How do we build on that? How do we have an AI for good? Well, we have an AI for good, James, because having learned what we've learned, we are no longer innocents. Right. right? <laughs> we, we know that these are massive information empires of unaccountable power that live outside of democratic governance, that live outside of the rule of law, because mm -hmm. we haven't invented those laws yet, and the institutions to, to, uh, to, to make those laws live in our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. So we are no longer innocents. We've lived through Cambridge Analytica, We've learned so much about surveillance capitalism and how it operates and how it can be pivoted to political manipulations and disinformation, as well as to the commercial project that we've already been discussing. So what is our work now? Our work now is to enter this third decade. We are, we are no longer innocents. We are no longer uh, digital virgins. Mm -hmm. We have learned. And so what we do is we, we use that learning and we now roll up our sleeves and we develop the institutional forms and we develop the laws and we develop the new regulatory paradigms mm -hmm. and we develop the new charters of rights that will allow us to reclaim the wonders and riches of artificial intelligence and of the entire digital landscape to reclaim these, to operate in the service of society, to operate in a way that is compatible with democracy, to operate in a way that is tethered to our real needs as human beings and our real societal needs. No and, longer and aimed that? at the surveillance dividend yes. and the profits of a narrow group of companies. And, 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 who, and, how, do, and how, do, how do I, Shoshana, actually affect that outcome? What's the way of actually making that happen? All right. Well, this is why um, uh, I, you know, I, I think if we take one message away, everybody, uh, you know, folks are saying now, as you kind of intimated, James, hey, COVID-19, everybody's scared, you bet. Fear produces uncertainty. Uncertainty opens us up to this state of exception. We'll do anything to feel better. That means that inevitably, we're heading toward a future of more surveillance. And whatever we used to think about surveillance capitalism or Cambridge Analytica or any of the rest of it, We've got to just, you know, bury all of that in favor of, yes, please give us the surveillance because we're scared. That's what I call drawing a straight line right. from today to the future. But my friends, the future never proceeds in a straight line. That's just not the way it works. 
just as we believed that this was going to be the golden age of a democratization of information and we end up under the thumbs of these information empires. Look at what's happening to the legitimate operations within our governments, public health. You know, the NHS, which is, which is revered within your country, James. It certainly is. You know, more, more people trust the NHS mm. in, in the UK than any other institution, more than they trust, uh, you know, parliament or, or, or anything else. The NHS is revered. But the NHS is now put on this collision course with Apple, Google, right? Who actually represent unaccountable power, mm -hmm. right? Because of essentially this manipulation of fear. So I think what's going to happen is, first of all, there is far too much toothpaste out of the tube yes. because we are no longer innocents. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the UK, above all, there's so much work being done in Parliament, in, in the House of Lords. Uh, there's so much work being done to begin to put into place new laws and new institutions. The same thing is happening in my country. Even just last night, we have new legislation coming out of a, a joint bill from the House and the Senate uh, to ensure that all of these health data coming through COVID-19 are going to be protected as private and yes. will be forced to disappear uh, once this crisis is over. Well, so, Shoshana, can, can I just ask yes. you got a very specific question? Someone yes, on the please. chat just asked, I think, a brilliant question. Would you, yes. down, would you download the tracing app? All right. So um, would I download the tracing app? Uh, interesting question. The Google Apple tracing app is currently conceived. Um, I believe does not do adequate service to the public health entities that need to be able to avail themselves of data in order to do their job as contact tracers. Contact tracing is an art and a science. Mm. It's been going on inside public health administrations for mm, a couple of centuries but you know seriously developed by professional public health administrators certainly through the course of the 20th century mm -hmm. within public health administration for many many decades you know those are dedicated professionals mm -hmm. who do operate under the rule of law they do operate under um democratic governance and uh they talk about in their own jargon what they call surveillance systems. They, right. and, and it's a completely benign meaning. Of course. Right? It's not the way we talk about surveillance systems. No, no, no. And that's, and that's the, reason I, the reason I ask you. I, I, I mean, I appreciate the point that says, look, I probably wouldn't download it because it's not effective, right? But, but the, the, I guess the question I'm trying to get at is, and as we come to close, it feels like the question of the moment around AI and data, yes. is that there is clearly a trade-off Government has been seen to have a level of power in a marketplace that we didn't properly appreciate. And now there's a question of our role, the citizen, which is, are we willing to surrender a certain amount of our data or even more of our data for a health and security benefit? Look, Google is a company that has been trying to get its hands around health data for many years. And there is a trail of uh, federal investigations and lawsuits over these uh, several episodes of how it has taken patient data without patient knowledge, um, using it to analyze, finding private documents of some of these um, uh, deals that have made, such as with the 2600 uh, chain hospital, the Ascension hospitals, and uh, in their private documents actually talking about how they're going to use these analyses without patient knowledge to predict patient treatment and use it to monetize right. 
So, <laughs> you know, the idea that uh, a Google Apple app is uh, somehow uh, altruistic uh, simply does not correspond to my understanding of what these companies are up to. This is going to become a feature of their operating systems. Once it does, our ability to actually oversee what they're doing, our ability to actually know what kind of data they're taking and what they're doing with it is going to become very, very limited, if indeed non-existent. What I want to see happen, James, yes. is I want to see our public health administrations who, who stand for the public good. Remember everybody, if we don't have a society and a democracy that stands for the rule of law, we have no more right to privacy. Mm -hmm. We have no more individual rights, mm -hmm. right? We have no more protections because it is society that makes possible the rule of law that legitimates and protects our rights in the first place. Mm -hmm. Public health is for the public good. Mm -hmm. So what we need is the kind of thing we see coming out of this bill that I mentioned that, that uh, just uh, yes. was published in, in Washington last night. We need emergency legislation that assures every citizen that our public health administrations are going to gather data the way they always have, that these data will be private, that these data will only be used for mitigating the public health crisis, and that once this crisis is over, these data will be eliminated. We need those laws, we need them now, and we put our faith in democratic law, let it be the beginning of the work we need to do for this decade, rather than allowing a private empire with its un unaccountable power to drive a wedge between citizens and their democratic governments, mm -hmm. which is exactly part of their strategy for a much longer game as they continue to accrue power and, and become those entities that actually substitute their own forms of algorithmic governance Mm -hmm. operating in alignment with their own monetization requirements and substitute that kind of governance for democracy itself. That's a long game. Mm -hmm. And that is a trajectory toward the future that we do not want. That's something that we want to avoid if we are going to pres preserve mm -hmm. the promise of democracy for, our, for ourselves, our families, for the next generation. Shoshana, that is a, that I didn't know in the course of our conversation that it was going to be possible to come out of it feeling anything other than rather dismal and nervous. But actually, the idea that at the end of this, we come away with a thought that this could be the beginning, that the requirements that we put in terms of our public data, our public health data, actually marks a new way of interacting um, with data, with technology, is, is, is fantastically invigorating. Um, we, we've tried and more or less succeeded to keep on time, and I'm going to do that now as we come to the end of this session. Yes, thank um, you. I wanted to say, um, well, a number of things, really. Um, first and foremost, uh, thank you to you, uh, Professor Zubo. Thank you, Shoshana. It has been fantastic to have that mix of analysis and depth of thinking with also the kind of passion for what uh, what you believe in. That's been absolutely invigorating for all of us. I want to say thank you to my uh, colleagues and gang at Tortoise because this has been a whole day that we've been discussing these issues and uh, particularly my colleagues Alexandra Musavizade, who is if you like, the, the one woman engine room of not just our thinking about AI, but tortoise intelligence and the work of our AI index. But there's a team that she works with and there's a team on the product side that has made it possible for us to talk to each other, not just on Zoom, but inside the tortoise app. But most importantly, 
I want to thank the people who've made this possible. So that's been our partners, Capita and Henkel X. And of course, everyone, the literally thousands of people who've registered and joined up today from all over the world. We don't for a moment take your time for granted. I think it's an extraordinary thing that you've spent the day with us. We hope if you're new to Tortoise, you'll take a free trial, join us and try and do what, what we do on the back of these thinkings, which use the information we've had to, uh, to inform our journalism. Uh, we'll follow up next week. Uh, all of these conversations will be available uh, in Tortoise, but we'll follow up uh, with, with everyone uh, and hope that we can give a proper readout of uh, all the conversations we've had. Uh, but for now, a heartfelt thank you to you, Shoshana, and to everybody else. Uh, you, a brilliant day. Uh, hope you have That's a very good everyone. weekend. All the best. Stay safe, be happy.